Hello, thank you for joining us here today. Um, I'm just gonna ask for a show of hands, how many of you teach online? All right, that's what I figured, <laughs> just making sure. <laughs> so um, we don't really need to introduce ourselves again because we already did that. So we handed out some yellow paper. If you didn't get one, Beth will walk around and give you a, a sheet. And we're hoping that you can do a quick think, write, pair, share. And first you need to think what is an objectivist approach to teaching and what is a constructivist approach to teaching. And just jot down a few notes on your page and then you can uh, pair and share with somebody next to you. All right, I, I hate to cut you short, but let's just bring it back to whole group again. Thank you. Um, so I made a, a little slide that shows what we're talking about here when we are defining constructivism versus objectivism. So in constructivism, we have that learning is constructed, whereas in objectivism, learning is transmitted knowledge. And we'll go through these in more depth in a few minutes. Um, in constructivism, teaching should let students participate in activities that are meaningful so that they can generate their own knowledge. And in objectivism, teaching should be teacher-directive, systematic, and structured. And then last, direct instruction is too rigid and too teacher-centered for constructivism. And, can, and in objectivist, the objectivist approach thinks that constructivist approaches are inefficient. Discovery learning is too unstructured and unsystematic. So um, I'll hand it over to Beth, but you can imagine um, somebody who's switching to online teaching for the first time from a constructivist approach had quite a difficult time <laughs> with um, balancing my teaching philosophy in there. All right, thank you, Diana. Um, so the advantages of construction, constructivism at the college level. This was um, how cons the constructivist model is viewed within higher education. Essentially, um, uh, active learning needs to take place for learning to occur. Um, through that active learning, uh, uh, students might connect their understandings to lifelong pursuits or uh, seek out connections to real life experiences. Um, uh, students actually better understand what it is that they're trying to understand uh, for longer periods and in more depth when they construct knowledge. Uh, so, uh, when students work in a constructiv constructivist approach, they're usually working collaboratively. And um, students who are also engaging in tasks that are designed around a constructivist approach are engaging in more rigorous tasks that require a higher level of cognitive demand. When we were working in our uh, particular online asynchronous course, we one, wanted to look at this within the perspective of mathematics education and particularly with uh, how students construct, meaning elementary school students construct uh, fraction knowledge, but then also how do pre-service teachers construct knowledge about student learning. So we were looking at this in, with many different lenses. Um, the main tenet that we brought forward was students learn mathematics well only when they construct their own mathematical understanding. So that was the, the basis for our, our uh, course design. All right, so like I said, um, I was in a, in, a, a, in a prior position, not at USU, where I had only taught mathematics methods in a face-to-face -face course and never online. In fact, I didn't know that methods courses to, existed <laughs> online and especially in mathematics education. So I was just coming from that view. Um, and so I was trying to think, and along with Beth, how do we mimic learning scenarios that happen in a classroom setting to an online setting? And what does this look like in terms of instruction and assessment? And how do we stay true to our teaching philosophy, which is constructivism, if you didn't know that by now? <laughs> um, so that's um, really the motivation for this presentation, because it I had to create an online course my first semester here in um, mathematics meth methods, and that's where I was kind of coming from. 
So here's what we thought about. So as you are beginning to consider how might the constructivist approach uh, inform your own online course design, I want you to take just a few moments and think um, what the different uh, tools are in a course design. There are teachers, there are textbooks, there's information, and then there's different areas that you all emphasize within your course design. Consider if you are using the constructivist, constructivist approach, would you consider the teacher as a facilitator or expert? Um, the textbook as a primary source or one of many. So look through these and decide how are these tools best utilized in an online course that would align with constructivist approaches. And go back to like that partner talk real quickly for about uh, 30 seconds to discuss what it is that you thought. So about 30 seconds to think, 30 seconds to share. All right, let's go ahead and come on back together. I hate to cut everyone short. I know that some of these conversations are really rich. All right, so I was listening into this conversation and I jumped in and, you know, we may understand that some of these uh, um, tools are utilized in different ways, but like questions still remain and this is why we put this slide here as to how we might use this in our own online course design. So. Um, I hope that many of you consider like the teacher as a facilitator, the textbook as one of many sources, information is discovered and the emphasis on process. But I think there's a lot of cognitive dissonance in the room as to like now what does this mean in an online course? Yes? So I have a question about the constructive approach. I'm not sure mm -hmm. yeah. because it actually fits really well with what I do. I'm in social science, right? Mm -hmm. Nice. What we would like to do, and there's no absolute truth because if there were, then we wouldn't be able to debate, right? Mm -hmm. How do you handle it with something like mathematics where there is an answer? Well, there are lots of different types of tasks in mathematics. Some being, uh, that, well, we'd categorize them into three different types of tasks. Closed tasks where you have one solution and one uh, path to that solution. And uh, quite often, you know, you see like procedures and accuracy being what it is that you're measuring. And then open middle where you have lots of different strategies and you're looking at problem solving and reasoning. And then you have open ended where there might be several different types of solutions and different paths to that solution. So that's probably for like a whole nother conversation. But yeah, there are different ways to help guide that inquiry in mathematics. Yeah. Um, so you know, the, the, I hope that we provided a little cognitive dissonance with this slide to help you think, now what does this mean for an online course? And we've got some tools to help you with that. Um, essentially when you're working um, with the teacher as a facilitator, you know, some ways to help, to help uh, support that is to guide and support students' learning. And sometimes that happens by posing tasks like I just actually explained um, that bring about different types of conceptual learning and uh, some different types of uh, discovery that occur through that. And then how do we uh, measure that? How do we understand that, what, that that's happening outside of the class? And how can that be brought forward in a more visible manner and discussed? So we're going to uh, discuss that in the, the next few slides. Um, to, to look at some of these tasks first, though, um, we're going to go ahead and pass out some yellow paper. And I want you just to first to solve this task the best way that you can and um, think about what types of uh, conceptual learning you might have gained from that, that task. And we encourage you to use this paper and not the... Uh, yeah, the, the lined paper does not serve you in this sense. <laughs> so please set that aside and use the, the blank paper. <laughs> All right, again, I hate to cut this short, but we don't have enough time. <laughs> so this is, this, is a, um, this is a task that we gave, that I gave in a face-to-face -face course. So we're going to compare it to what we might give to an online course. But first, let me just show you how um, this was in a middle grades math methods class. So we'll show you how he solved this problem. We won't have to hit play toys. The bar drawn below is seven thirds as long as a, can as a whole candy bar. Draw the whole candy bar. 
So this whole bar here represents seven thirds. So what I have done here is partition it into uh, seven, seven equal pieces. So that would represent the, the numerator here. So we need to draw a whole candy bar. So a whole candy bar represents three thirds. That equals one. So what I have done here is drawn a rectangle that would mod, that would, or I have iterated part of this candy bar here to make a hole, which is represented as one, two, three. So I have drawn here. Is, yeah, and shade it in. So there you go. Oh, this is me. I'm sorry. <laughs> we obviously are not communicating well. So um, in that now, uh, you might have noticed that the student was go engaging in more of a discovery learning type of an activity. You know, he was constructing fraction knowledge through that task. And we wanted to see, you know, how might this transfer over to some of the things we want to do in an online course. So we looked at some of the active learning that uh, uh, people use in face-to-face -face courses, and we transition that over to an online course. So for instance, we've done a lot of think, write, pair, shares today. You guys have engaged in that. That's an active learning strategy in a face-to-face -face course. So how might that look in an online course? Well, in the online course, we did a think, video, discuss. So the students did a task just like what you had done, only they used rods in the, in the um, online course instead of the drawing. And they videotaped that, and then they posted those, and they discussed how different people solved that task. Um, and in class prompt, you might ask students to, to stop and uh, reflect upon particular readings or discussion points that you're bringing forward. And we tend to find those in our discussion forums. Um, when we have videos, uh, in class, and sometimes we have a discussion post, like we'd said earlier. So some of these things we found were easily, easy to transition over. Um, in our, for example, in our online course, we had the, the same question when they use Cuisine Rods, like I said, which are just like uh, non-partitioned blocks. And um, they had to post those, and then different students responded. So let's see what, the student, what a student did in an online course. The question was, if the purple rod is two-thirds, what rod represents seven-sixths? So first, I want to define one-third of the whole by finding a rod that partitions the purple rod in half, which would be two red rods. Then I found the whole, which would be three red rods, using iterating, because the purple rod equals two-thirds, and three red rods equals three-thirds, so I know that this is the whole. The question asks for what rod equals 7 sixth. I know that 2 sixth equals 1 third, which is 1 red rod. So I need to find a rod that partitions the red rod in half, which equals 2 white rods. Um, then I filled in the rest of the space using iterating to find the whole. Leave that in there. Um, so now I have the original two thirds of the whole, the whole partitioned into thirds, the whole partitioned, and then the whole partitioned into sixth. Now I need to find seven sixths. So I have one, two, three, four, five, six. So I add one more to make seven sixths. So now I just need to find a rod that represents this length, which would be the black rod. So the answer to the question is what rod represents 7 sixths? It would be the black rod. So you can imagine in an online course, the students are in groups of, say, 10-ish or less. I think more than 10 is too much for this. And they, re they all post their videos. They're not allowed to see others' videos until they post their own. And then you can imagine just by seeing how you all solve this problem that there's different ways to think about it and there's d many different ways to do this. And so they're able to see everybody's different ways of solving it and they have to respond in their response post what did you see, what did you learn? And this semester, we're having them do a prompt um, saying, 
I used to think, and they have to fill that in, now I think, and they fill that in to make it more specific because what happened to me last semester was a lot of people just posted, oh, good work. It's like, mm, yeah, mm. That's, and that's no points. So. <laughs> just as a back, background, um, the students we had about, <coughs> was it like about 100 students in this online course? And so they were grouped into discussion groups, and that's why we had um, you know, uh, uh, students responding only to a small group of other students instead of having everybody responding to everybody's, because that would have been you know, really overwhelming. <laughs> and I think only if some students would have gotten responses, too. I'm just going to let you think about this on your own, because we are... We went over our time. So <laughs> how is the information discovered and how is the emphasis on the process as opposed to the product? So one of the main things when we're developing these sorts of tasks is we're putting the emphasis on the process. If they come up with the incorrect answer, like yes, we recognize that, but it's not on, on the answer being right or wrong. It's about the thinking that's getting you to that. Um, and then fixing the mi misconception. So I have to skip this one because of time, but what I was going to show you is in this online course, we have a lot of different sources as opposed to just having readings. We have videos of teachers in class teaching these things. We have students talking about how they're doing it, elementary school students. And we have um, different articles and PowerPoints, just a bunch of different sources. So we don't make students go out and find their sources as true constructivism would, but we do provide them with many different sources each week. Okay. Okay. We we're going to do this one. In a yeah. Okay. Yeah. Just yes. like one last slide. Sorry. <laughs> so, um, at some possible advantages to the constructivist online approach, um, you know, when you're using this, it provides opportunities to, for students to um, develop strategies and processes to construct their own knowledge, as opposed to it being uh, teacher driven and um, and direct uh, directly provided for them. Uh, when we, we embrace our, uh, the information technology that's available, available to us, we end up finding as course designers, there's a wealth of resources, uh, both online and within Canvas. Uh, emphasizing that professor-student and student-student interaction that we're all learners, that we're not coming with, uh, with always having the answer in our back pocket. And um, student, having a student-centered tasks that, uh, where their reasoning comes forward as opposed to um, them just taking what's from the reading or from, the, from um, our own discussions as uh, primary. Um, bringing these all together provides just a deeper understanding of the content as the students start to develop pedagogy of their own. Um, and then th the last slide just shows some different ways that you can connect theory to practice. I'm just going to kind of leave that here as we take questions. But it looks at the same tenets that we brought forward around the constructivist approach and looks at different types of tools that you might use when you are designing your courses um, to provide more constructivist types of um, opportunities for your students. Okay? So we'll open it up for any questions. We have five minutes.